Okay, well, we're delighted to have our second speaker of this morning, Maggie Miller from Stanford, who will talk to us about non-isotopic ciphered surfaces. Thanks, Thanks Maggie. and uh, this is joint with Kyle Hayden, Sung Wong Kim, Jung Han Park, and Isaac Sundberg. I think Jung is here, is he here? Yeah, okay. Um, so I've given this talk a few times in the last few weeks, and, and Tom Rothko already saw it once, so I'm gonna do it different this time. So I'm gonna talk about Kavanaugh homology, so it's still boring for you, but confusing for everybody else now, so it's like, you know, skip the easy part. Um, okay, so uh, let me start off by, by motivating the problem that I'm gonna talk about. So here's the, the, the background motivating principle, uh, motivation, which is that ciphered surfaces uh, can be interesting which is pretty non-intuitive for me as a four-dimensional topologist, um, which is uh, nicer than how I said it two weeks ago, but Jen told me that was controversial. Um, so uh, when I say that ciphered surfaces can be interesting, what? I, I don't know, it's being recorded, so. Uh, okay, so um, when I say that ciphered surfaces can be interesting, I mean that for a fixed knot, we can find distinct ciphered surfaces in S3 that are the same as surfaces, but different as embeddings. Um, so I could have a knot K. Um, here is my second favorite knot, the end knot. Um, and it could bound two surfaces, let's say uh, S0, uh, which is genus one, and S1, which is also genus one. So let me draw a, another genus one surface. Ah, ah, ah. Okay, great. Uh, which are not isotopic to each other. And in this particular case, it's very easy to prove that these two surfaces aren't isotopic to each other because what you could do is compute the fundamental groups of their two complements. Um, and we'll see that, well, pi one of S3 minus S0 is just a free group, uh, I guess on two generators. Whereas um, pi one of S3 minus this other surface, S1, well, you see that it looks like a figure eight. Um, so in fact, this whole surface is just a figure eight thickened up with a little band attached to it. So this is the, the figure eight group, um, that looks confusing, uh, free product Z, figure eight. Okay, um, so these aren't the same group, which means these surfaces can't be isotopic to each other. I don't even have to say rel boundary. Um, but these surfaces also aren't very interesting, and I think that's not very controversial, because they can easily be simplified, um, because both of these surfaces are compressible. By which I mean I could find uh, a small disk properly embedded into the complement of the surface, um, in either the S0 complement or the S1 complement, and use that disk to cut the surface or compress it to make it a genus zero. And if I do that, then these two genus zero surfaces disks will be isotopic row boundary that follows from the, the, the Schoenflies uh, theorem in this dimension, or you could just like see it in this one, I don't know. Um, so these surfaces are different, but somehow they're like barely different because uh, they would be the same if you did a very simple operation. So the first legitimately interesting examples I think are due to Alford in the 1970s. So I wanna, am I gonna write over this line? No, probably not. So Alford, in the 1970s, constructed the following pair of ciphered surfaces. Now I have to use a slightly more interesting knot. It's still not my favorite knot. I don't care about this knot. Um, so let me draw a non-trivial knot. I'll draw like a clasp, and then I'll sort of tie something in it that's shaped like a trefoil. Um, I was really nervous during Robert's talk about how many pictures he had, and I was like, I'm using chalk. I can't compete with that, so I'm really pushing myself. Um, so. Uh, here's my non-trivial knot, and I'm gonna construct two different ciphered surfaces for this knot that uh, will not be isotopic to each other, but they also won't be compressible, okay? Um, so I'm going to temporarily add two more boundary components to this picture as two small unknots that link these two strands. I hope you can see the colors. It looks kind of okay on zoom, peekaboo. Um, and I'm gonna start filling in a surface starting at this pink like hole, coloring in pink and have my surface come through the blue hole like this and then flip around to the blue back and tie a band shaped like this trefoil and eventually come through the pink hole and end at the blue circle. Okay, so this was a planar surface whose boundary was the white knot that I drew along with the pink and blue circle. 
Um, to get rid of these two boundary components, I'm going to attach a tube whose boundary is the pink circle and the blue circle. But I want to get two surfaces, so I'm going to consider two different possible choices of tube. Um, so one of those choices is going to look like, well, here's my, my pink circle and my blue circle. Um, I'm just going to take a tube that starts at the blue and just like completely ignores the, the trefoil, like sort of draw it faintly here. Sort of like a bubble that like swallows the whole trefoil. So this is called a swallow tube. Let me erase this because that's going to make my picture a little mad. Okay, but something like this. Ugh. Or I could choose a different tube, still with these same two boundary circles, but now I'm going to take a tube that's shaped like the trefoil. Okay, so it's called the follow tube because it follows the path of, of the band that I drew. Okay, um, and so it's, it's a little bit less obvious in this diagram than in the, the first one. Not that this should have been obvious if you didn't know that this was true. But again, these two surfaces have complements um, with different fundamental groups. So they're certainly not isotopic to each other. Um, but these are also genus one surfaces. Um, and this boundary knot K is not the unknot. You could compute like just literally anything about it, basically, and determine that it's not the unknot. So these are certain, certainly minimum genus, um, which means that they're also incompressible. Um, OK, so ciphered surfaces can be interesting, um, I guess. And people write a lot of papers about you know, constructing different kinds of non-isotopic surfaces. Uh, they don't all differ by this like tube construction. There's things involving satellites or Morisugi sum. There's ways to get infinite families of non-isotopic surfaces. Um, but then you have to question, like, is this interesting? Um, so I am more interested in four-dimensional topology. So from my perspective, uh, this setting is a little bit unnatural. The problem is that you know, my surfaces have boundary. But they're embedded in S3, which is not as interesting as S4. Um, and, and it's not even a proper embedding, because they have boundary, and, and S3 doesn't have boundary. And there's like sort of no way to fix that, unless I remember that S3 is actually like best viewed as the boundary of B4. Um, so, so here's my picture of S3. Um, great. Uh, I draw it as like one dimension less than we see, because it is one dimension less than the preferred dimension, which is 4. So this is S3. Um, and now it's very easy to see that it's the boundary of the four ball. It's sort of this lower half space here. Um, and up to now, I've been drawing surfaces that all look like, well, I have a knot that's in the boundary, and I have a surface that's also in the boundary. Um, and I guess I have another surface that's also in the boundary. Um, and now it's clear what to do to make these embeddings proper. I'll just push the interiors of both of these surfaces uh, a little bit into the four ball. Um, so I'll just keep this here and sort of push this down. So let's make the embeddings proper. It takes me so long to write. OK. But we lose a lot of our interesting behavior when we do that. So let's look at these two surfaces, which were like borderline interesting before. And we push their interiors into B4. And suddenly, they actually become isotopic, even rel boundary. And it's very easy to see in this particular case, um, because what is really the difference between these two surfaces? It's uh, this crossing, or really any of them, I guess. But if I were allowed to just do this by isotopy, sort of pull this part of the tube in front, um, well, now this looks like a trivial knot instead of the figure eight. And so I could sort of like unknot everything and, and make it look like this, just by isotopy. Um, of course, in S3, you can't do that. Uh, crossing changes are, are not isotopy. But if we had a fourth dimension of freedom, then I could pull this tube that looks like it's in front and uh, pull it into the fourth dimension first, and then backwards, and then back to where I started, and I would achieve the crossing change. OK, so um, these surfaces are not isotopic in any sense in S3, uh, but they are smoothly isotopic in uh, B4, even rel boundary. OK. Um, these two surfaces uh, like seem more intimidating than the first ones, but actually it's the exact same behavior. Um, when we push their interiors into the four ball, close to the boundary, they both look like this, exactly the same. And then a little bit further into the interior of the four ball, we see one of these two tubes. But again, the difference between these two tubes is just well, a crossing of this trefoil. And now that I have a fourth dimension of freedom, I could change the crossing and make the tube look the same. 
So um, these kind of seem scarier, but it's not any harder to argue than, in fact, these two surfaces are also smoothly isotopic rel boundary once you push them into the, the four ball. So not isotopic in S3, but they are isotopic in B4. Um, and, and so as I mentioned, not Whoa. Not every construction of non-isotopic Seifert surfaces looks like these examples where the difference is a tube. Um, but yet, in, in almost every example uh, or construction that I'm aware of, there's a fundamental reason that the surfaces have to become isotopic smoothly, even rel boundary, once you push them into the four ball. Um, I say almost because, well, well OK, never mind. Um, so here's the motivating question. Um, this is in uh, sort of in, in text in a, in, a, in a paper of Livingston in 1982. He was studying Seifert surfaces of the unlink and showing that any two surfaces that were the same as surfaces uh, became isotopic once you push them into the four ball. Um, and he also showed that that was true for a certain family of, of surfaces with non-trivial boundary constructed in the 70s. Um, and he asked, like, is this a, a general principle? So must. Oh, I put the lid on my chalk, which means I can't make the more chalk come out. Okay. Must uh, my two surfaces, let's just call them S0 and S1, uh, genus G Seifert surfaces with the same boundary, uh, be isotopic once you push them into B4? Uh, and he said, you know, Probably not, presumably not, and we just don't have the right example. And then uh, I guess at, at, at this point, well, I mean, what invariant would you use? It's hard to guess in advance, like how you would distinguish the surfaces, I think. Um, so the theorem that we proved, which uh, Robert actually um, implied in his talk at the end, or said a particular statement from the paper, uh, so what are our initials, H-K-M-P-S. This is easy for me because uh, Kyle and I wrote another paper that was also Kumps, but with like two Ks, it was like Kumps. So I've just been giving the same thing for a year. Um, so uh, theorem, 2022, uh, no. Great. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll draw you an example. Where am I going to put it? I guess I'm going to put it here. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm going to draw two Seifert surfaces whose boundary is the same knot. Uh, again, it's kind of like a mess to have both of the surfaces completely in one picture, but, but this time I'll just draw two copies of the knot. So uh, I'm going to start off by drawing a torus link. So something like this. Uh, so come around and connect everything. Okay, I hope you were impressed by that. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to draw like another torus link because I'm going to be constructing two knots. So uh, the same link again. Uh, okay, and then connect everything up. Oh, oh no, oh no, oh no, no, it's okay. Uh, I almost got too cocky, but it, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, we're good. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to start constructing two surfaces. Uh, right now, the boundary is a link, but let's like, ignore that little problem. I mean, maybe you don't even think that's a problem. I just don't like that. Um, OK, so I've drawn here a two-component torus link. Both components are left-handed trefoils. Um, no particular reason. I just think that looks nicer. Uh, and because it's a torus link with two components, that means I have two knots that are like parallel to each other. They lie on a torus where they cut the torus into two annuli. So I want to draw those two annuli. Um, so here's one of them. I, have to use yellow for the first one, or else I'll be confused later. So I'm just going to color in a strip between these two parallel strands. And this annulus is going to be shaped like a left-handed trefoil. OK, so I hope you can see this trefoil sitting in the picture. Um, and to get the other annulus, well, I could just rotate this picture pi over 3. The knot would look the same, but the annulus would look different, because somehow it's like every other pieces filled in. Um, so this one obviously has to be blue. So see here, this wasn't filled in before. Um, and I'll draw, again, an annulus that is shaped like a left-handed trefoil. OK, great. Um, so right now, these two surfaces uh, 
actually are isotopic if I don't say real boundary. That's obvious because I just sort of rotate pi over 3. And I really don't want to worry about boundary. Um, so uh, the way I'm going to fix that, and at the same time fix that their boundary is link, is by attaching a band to connect the two boundary components. Um, so I'll attach a band here. Uh, so color this in yellow. And I, originally I had an annulus, and I attached a band. So this is now a genus 1 surface. So I'll call this sigma 0. Um, and then I need to attach, uh, well, at least something with the same boundary here, because I want to still have the same knot. So I'll just attach, like, literally the same band. So something like this. Um, so I'll draw a blue band here. OK, and so this is sigma 1, and it's also genus 1. And actually, it's very easy to argue that these two surfaces are not isotopic in S3. I don't have to say rel boundary or anything. Um, because even though this looks like a complicated picture with a lot of crossings and stuff, it is just an annulus with a band attached to it. And that annulus was shaped like a left-handed trefoil. That means this whole surface could deformation retract onto um, this left-handed trefoil with a band attached along an arc like this. Okay. Um, on the other hand, well, this surface is also like a left-handed triple annulus with a band attached. Uh, but it looks kind of different. If I draw this left-handed trifoil, it's sort of rotated a bit. Um, and this band, it, see how the ends are all on like one petal of the trifoil? So it, it looks more like this. Is that showing up? Yeah, I think that's OK. OK, um, so actually, it's just the exact same thing as before. Um, if you've ever seen tunnel number, then you might just recognize like why this picture looks good. But uh, very easy to, to, to compute that pi 1 of S3 minus sigma 0 is free. Um, and pi 1 of S3 minus sigma 1 is uh, the trefoil group uh, free product Z, which is not free. OK. Um, so they're certainly not isotopic in S3. Uh, but that doesn't tell us anything, because we don't care about S3 right now. We care about B4. And these guys had different fundamental groups in their complements, and they were isotopic. Um, so the theorem that I'm, I'm not going to prove uh, is that sigma 0 and sigma 1 are not topologically isotopic uh, in B4. Um, I will tell you what the proof is, and I'll just tell you that it's very easy, and if you felt like it, you could do it, maybe. Um, so the, the proof is that the, uh, the two-fold branched covers, so the double covers of B4 um, branched along uh, the surfaces are not homeomorphic. Um, that's a pretty good obstruction. Uh, they are distinguished by their intersection form on H2. OK. Uh, so if they were topologically isotopic, then what well, I'm saying, not homeomorphic. This is all like just t t top topological topology. Um, so that would mean that the double branch covers would be homeomorphic, but they're not. OK. Um, so here's a much less impressive theorem. And I think I'm going to move back to the whole other side of the board, even though maybe that's weird. Well, I think I'm going to work my way back over there by the end. What time is it? Oh, yeah, definitely. OK. Uh, so here's, here's a much more difficult and much less impressive theorem, which is a theorem sigma 0 and sigma 1 are not smoothly isotopic rel boundary. OK, so you see the, the, the first problem here. Like, we don't care about this because they're not topologically isotopic, so what's the point of that? Um, but let's prove this. OK, so um, and in particular, let's focus on this word smooth, and then I'll justify, I'll justify myself later. OK, so um, I'm going to prove that these two surfaces are not smoothly isotopic real boundary. And I, I'm really going to work smoothly and use something that obstructs specifically smooth topology. Um, and there's not like that many options. There are several papers now about obstructing smooth isotopy of surfaces in the four ball. Um, Robert talked about that at the end of his talk. You could use like the, the not flare cobordism maps or the Kavanov cobordism maps, or I guess that's it. Um, so let's use the Kavanov cobordism maps. So proof is that um, sigma 0 and sigma 1 induce uh, different maps 
on uh, Kavana homology. Okay, so I, I thought it would be fun to show you how to like actually compute something and prove this. Um, so this is going to be, I mean, if you know about Kavana homology, then this is going to be very basic, but I think it'll be fun to like see an example. And if you don't know about Kavana homology, this is going to seem like a series of random steps, but then you'd know how to compute the maps, even if you don't know what they are. So that's pretty good. Um, so let me erase this and explain myself. So the point here is that whenever we have a, a surface cobordism, in this case, uh, a surface sigma, which is a cobordism from a knot, K, uh, does anybody know what R naught is? Like, what's the boundary of sigma I? That's a very familiar knot. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's the, it's the negative six frame negative whitehead double of the left-handed trefoil, duh. Um, OK. So, uh, we have a surface cobordism. It goes from k, so that's shorthand for this case, that, um, uh, to the, the empty knot. Um, but, but really, I could just take any surface cobordism between like two links. Um, then we get an induced uh, cobordism map, cobordism map, uh, kh of, of sigma, which goes from uh, the Kavana homology of k to the Kavana homology of uh, the empty knot, which we'll see what that is. OK. Um, and I'm, I'm going to remind you, if you haven't seen it before, I'll tell you, uh, well, sort of what this object is, and then some examples uh, of what this map is that are enough that you could compute it in some cases. OK. Um, so first of all, what we need to know is that the chain complex for Kavana homology is generated. Um, I'm going to work over Z mod 2 by labeled smoothings, uh, this means smoothings, of my knot. OK, so I guess maybe I should not use k if something else is already named k. So what do I mean by this? I mean, well, I take, in particular, actually a diagram of a knot. I take a fixed diagram of my favorite knot. Uh, this is not my favorite knot. Um, so here's, here's d. Um, and at each one of the crossings, I'm going to make a choice of how to get rid of that crossing by either uh, replacing it with like two vertical arcs or replacing it with two horizontal arcs. And there's like a way of, of naming these, like zero or one. That doesn't matter. That does matter, but I don't care. Um, so I'll get something that looks like, I don't know, this. That's fine. Um, and then for, for every, so that's smoothings. And then for every circle that I get, once I do all this smoothing, I need to choose on that circle to label it with either a 1 or an x. OK, so I could label this like 1. Um, so this is a perfectly good labeled smoothing, and it shows up in the chain complex. Um, and then the rule for when a labeled smoothing gives me a cycle, a cycle, if and only if, for each zero smoothing, it actually does matter. But for each of one of the types of smoothings, uh, replacing it with one would merge two x circles. So we're not actually going to really worry about this rule right now. But I do want to just convey that even though I'm talking about the chain complex, um, it's very simple to decide if any element represents a cycle, which would be in Kavana homology. Um, so that's not really a problem here. I, I want to focus on Kavana homology, but I know exactly which things are in Kavana homology. So that's fine. OK. Um, so let me give you an example of a cobordism map. So I said Alfred. That was right. That was right. It was Alfred. Good. Sometimes I say Trotter. OK. So. Example, um, here's the best example. The Kovanov map of the disk, um, which would go from the Kovanov homology of the unknot to the Kovanov homology of the empty set. Well, first of all, I said we were going to see what the Kovanov homology of the empty link is. And actually, from this definition, now we can. Um, so I've pre-prepared a diagram of the empty link. Um, 
OK? So to get the Kapanov chain complex, we will consider all possible labeled smoothings. Um, as you can see, there are no crossings, so there's no choices to be made for smoothings. And you don't get any circles, so there's no choices to be made for labelings. So there's exactly one labeled smoothing. It's this one. Um, it's generated over Z mod 2, so we get Z mod 2, and just uh, it's like obviously a cycle. So the, the homology is Z mod 2. Um, so this is Z mod 2. Uh, and it's, yeah, OK. Um, and well, there's a clear diagram of the unknot that's our favorite diagram. I think that's not controversial. Um, and there's no crossings in that diagram. Uh, so, so we don't have to worry about smoothings. But there is one circle, and we could label it 1 or x. So to tell you what this map is, I'll tell you that. Well, when you take uh, the label x, you go to 1 in z mod 2. And when you take the label 1, you go to 0 in z mod 2, which does make you question the labeling conventions. But that's OK. OK, um, so that is the example. Um, and I'll tell you that probably my favorite thing about Kavanaugh homology, well, first of all, I care about surfaces. So Kavanaugh cobordism maps are great. Um, but the thing that I really like about them is that you can compute them. That's like a backhanded dish at not floor, uh, not floor homology. Um, uh, and there's, there's lots of references for this. So the sort of canonical ones, I think, are uh, Barnaton in uh, 2002 uh, wrote a paper about how to compute these cobordism maps by um, like subdividing the surface into a sequence of very small standard pieces, at least in some cases. Um, and then Elliot maybe did a few more cases in uh, 2009. And then my favorite reference is the uh, Hayden Sundberg paper from last year, uh, 2021, which has some very nice tables of, of certain small surfaces uh, and the corresponding maps really on the Kavanaugh chain complex. OK, uh, surfaces with a, like a fixed diagram. Um, so let me tell you a few basic ones that we're going to use to compute uh, the induced maps from these two surfaces on at least one cycle. Because that's all we need to distinguish surfaces is produce one cycle where we get one for one surface and zero for the other. OK, so um, here's, here's, a few, here's a few surfaces. Uh, when I say small, I mean like ugh, really small. Um, here's a surface which, uh, starting at the top, I'm going to have like a fixed diagram. So a diagram that looks like it has this little kink in it. And as I go down, I'm going to do a Reitermeister 1 move that gets rid of the crossing. And this traces out a surface. Um, the surface looks like this. Does that help? OK. Um, so of, of course, you know it's isotopic to a product, but it's a fixed diagram. Um, and so this induces a map on the chain complex. Um, I'm only going to worry about circles that are all labeled x, because I'm very lazy. Uh, and so then there's only two different labeled states, smoothings, that I'm going to worry about, because uh, I could smooth this way, or I could smooth this way. And so this, this, is, this is the rule. This one maps to like the, the corresponding state downstairs. And this, this looks confusing, because it's like a circle. But this is a 0. I don't really know this is 0. So, this disappears. Um, so this is very easy to deal with whenever you have sort of a Reitermeister 1 move, simplifying your surface. Um, we're going to see that in a second. Um, we can also deal very easily with Reitermeister 2 moves, at least in the simplest case. Um, so let's take the trace of doing a Reitermeister 2 move, um, by which I mean like sort of this surface. Does that help? Um, OK. And again, I'm going to say all x. And I'm just going to give you the non-trivial ones. Um, well, if I smooth sort of the, the obvious way, where like I ignore the right of Meister 2, no surprise. This maps to the, the standard thing down here. Um, and then something weird happens, which I'll explain in a second. But specifically, if I smooth like kind of the other symmetric way, and these two strands happen to be in the same circle, then this also maps to this. And all the other all x labelings go to 0. OK. Um, and now we have like the big guy. So what's, what's the most useful small surface? It's uh, this one. OK. Um, so this is a picture of a saddle. 
Um, at the top, we have like two strands sort of vertical with some perspective. And at the bottom, we have two strands horizontal. And I've drawn an index one point, which I've flattened out. Okay, because uh, that's kind of the best I can draw, I guess. Um, so, well, there's no issue with like smoothing up here. Locally, I haven't drawn any crossings. Um, and again, I'm taking all X labelings. Uh, but, but there's something weird here, which I'm going to motivate, which is that um, if I'm splitting one circle into two, then that's OK. Like this, this smoothing goes to this smoothing. Um, but if I'm trying to uh, merge two distinct circles into one, uh, that is just the zero map. OK. Um, so let me give you some circular logic for why these are all reasonable. Um, so why is this reasonable? Here's a fact. If your surface is smoothly compressible, um, I already told you what compressible meant, so that's great. But now I mean compressible in B4 or S3 cross I. Then its induced map is just the zero map. Um, I think this is a cool feature. Uh, so this is circular logic. So I'm telling you that if you know this is true, then these two rules make sense. Because really a tube looks like two bands, sort of the bottom and the top of the tube, um, but they're each like different of these types. Like you'll have one that looks like this and one that looks like this. Um, OK, I won't draw that or explain that. If you've seen this before, you either know that and that's obvious or you don't know that and that's hard to visualize. Um, but that's true. And so if, if you have a tube, you'll get at least one instance of this map. And therefore, the map is 0. Um, so that's circular, because really, like, you, just, you know these are the maps from Kavanov, and then you prove this, and it's like, ah, oh, what a great feature. But if you don't know Kavanov homology, then you should like this and remember this, and then believe that this makes sense. Um, and then the same thing here, why did I want these to be in one circle? Well, it kind of looks like that one. That makes sense. OK. OK, fine. Um, yeah. Uh, this you merge the two, but th this isn't merging. This is um, what do you mean? Well, yeah, it's it's. There's no critical point. It's, oh, yeah. don't throw me off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> please save any mistakes until after the talk. <laughs> okay, um, so great. Uh, this is enough information that we can actually compute the induced map uh, of, of both of these surfaces on one particular uh, labeled smooth thing. And I thought that I was going to have more space. And now I'm like, where am I going to put it? Uh, the, oh, we don't care about the topological isotopy theorem. This is not redundant. It's actually much better. But we don't want to think about that. OK, um, so let me draw a particular uh, labeled smoothing of the diagram of the knot that I've drawn here. Um, I don't want to sort of draw it over one of the pictures because I think that'll be really hard to look at. Cool. OK, I am going to draw it over this line. Yeah, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Oh, it's not fine. OK. Oh. OK, so this is like this top part here. Like, see, this is like sort of the top of this band. OK. Um, OK, so I'll just claim that this is like a labeled smoothing. It kind of looks like the two knots. That's fine. Um, and I'm going to label them all x, because that's all I told you how to compute. So if I have any ones, then we won't know what to do. OK, and let's, let's look at these two surfaces, how they behave with respect to this particular smoothing. So I'll draw parts of the surfaces in the picture so that you can see. So let's, let's start with sigma 0. And maybe I'll note that, well, sigma 0 includes a strip that looks like this. So when I push the interior of sigma 0 into the 4-ball, it's going to look like I could start with the boundary. And then maybe I see this little strip first. We'll keep that a little bit higher than everything else. So it's like a band in the surface. Um, so if I look at how it hits this picture, that band sits here. Um, so when I'm computing the effect of the induced map of sigma 0 on this state, the first step is to say, well, this looks like um, I have an index one point. That's what that band is. And it's, uh, it's merging two circles that are both labeled x. Um, so the effect of the map is 0. So just immediately, with very little work, I can tell that 
Um, let's name this state phi. This is a cycle in Kavana homology. That uh, the induced map from sigma 0 on this particular cycle is 0. OK, great. Um, now, what about sigma 1? Well, I'll just tell you, like, we can't find a band that looks like that. Um, so, so what do I do? Well, sigma 1, it's genus 1. When, it, when I push it into the four ball, what will happen is attached to the boundary, I'm going to see two bands that sit in the surface. Maybe something like, uh, I don't know, this. OK, so I'll draw those in this picture. You see that neither of them merge two circles. And once these two bands appear, the rest of the surface is just a disk. Um, so I know this is kind of bad, but it's like blackboard, so I think nobody will really mind if I just sort of delete these for a second and call this D. Oh, well, that's confusing. D. OK, and I really want to think of this disk as, as not just a disk floating around, but a disk drawn in a particular way. OK, and um, the effect of like, doing both of these two band maps is to split one x-labeled circle into two, which is, is fine. I just split it, and I get a new state for this diagram. So I would like, actually do the splitting. OK. Well, so now um, maybe we can justify why I chose the rest of the state, um, or like why I chose this particular state. This is carefully orchestrated so that, well, first of all, I notice that this disk is really nice. Like, this drawing of it is really nice. And I'm not just, like, complimenting myself. I mean that um, I can unknot it, by which I mean make it small and round and standard, by only performing exactly these two moves. Um, Rheinmeister twos that just pull two pieces of the disk from being over under each other to being apart and don't involve anything else in the surface. Um, and right in Meister 1 moves, they just sort of like untwist a little piece of the disk. Um, so I don't mean that just as a move on the knot, I mean that as a move on the disk. Okay? Um, so I could do right in Meister 2 moves here, and then a 1 here to get rid of this whole part, and then keep going around and just doing a bunch of 2 and 1 moves. So it's really good that I never have to do R3 moves, which are much harder to deal with, and it's, it's nice that it's a very simple form of right in Meister 1 and 2. OK, and in particular, this state has been chosen so that every time I do a Reitermeister 1 or 2 move, it looks like these non-trivial models that I've drawn here. Um, so you can see like this Reitermeister 1 move uh, here that I would do to start simplifying my disk. It looks like the resolution that gave me the uh, non-trivial map. Okay? So um, when I start simplifying my disk, I can change my state by just getting rid of the circle. And I'll still have a bunch of circles that are all labeled x. Um, and similarly, I guess, uh, well, if I start doing Reitermeister 2 moves, this R2 uh, looks like this local model. Um, so I'm just going to like sort of keep the same state, and everything is just labeled x. And again, like I start doing another Reitermeister 2 move, and I'll be able to check that it'll look like this local model. And this always happens. So at the end, what I get, I get that kh of sigma 1 evaluated on this same cycle. I'll be able to simplify it and get that it's kh of just the disk without any crossings uh, evaluated on a cycle with all labeled x's, uh, which I carefully made sure to tell you was 1 and not 0. OK, so I'll get 1. Um, OK, and so we conclude the theorem. Um, well, this mean, this, these maps are well-defined up to smooth isotopy real boundary, really like smooth diffeomorphism real boundary, um, which means that these two surfaces can't be smoothly isotopic. OK, um, awesome. So uh, without too much work, we can get rid of this real boundary thing by just um, investigating the symmetry group of the knot. Uh, I did tell you it was a minus six frame negative whitehead double of the left-handed trefoil. So it actually has a lot of symmetry from the whitehead double part and the trefoil part. Um, but we know explicitly what the symmetry is. You could just check. I just checked. It was easy. Um, OK. So they're not smoothly isotopic. Um, the problem is that I originally told you that they're not topological isotopic, which is obviously better. And this, I have to say, it was harder than the not topological isotopic thing. So what was the point of that? Well, the point of that, I lost my cloth. 
the point of that, well, I told you that they weren't topologically isotopic via an intersection form argument. That's algebra. Um, on the other hand, they're not smoothly isotopic by the Kavanaugh cobordism maps, which I'm just going to say is diagrammatic, uh, a diagrammatic argument. Um, so to get an interesting statement, we should do something to the theorem premise that is like good diagrammatically and bad algebraically. Um, so here's a theorem. Uh, the whitehead doubles, I'll say what that means because they're surfaces of sigma 0 and sigma 1, these two particular surfaces. Uh, people on Zoom can't see them, but you know. Um, whitehead 0 and whitehead uh, sigma 1 are also not smoothly isotopic. Um, so I'll just draw a schematic of what I mean by whitehead double of a surface, because usually we say whitehead double of a knot. Um, well, let's, okay. let's say that this is uh, one of my surfaces, sigma. Um, its boundary is this knot k. Um, this is probably how, like, I don't know this line. Uh, okay. Um, well, I'm going to construct a surface where I'm going to start off with two parallel copies of sigma, um, motivated by how we construct a whitehead double, I guess, of a knot. So here's k. Uh, they each have genus. OK. Um, and then I'm going to connect these two disjoint surfaces by a band um, in, in the boundary. I, I can push the interior of the band a little bit in. OK, so I, I hope that this is clear enough. Um, so in particular, the boundary of whitehead of, if, if, if boundary of sigma is equal to k, then the boundary of the whitehead double of sigma is the whitehead double of k. Uh, so that's good. That would be awful if that weren't right. Um, and we've also doubled the genus of the surface. So originally sigma was genus 1, and now the whitehead double is genus 2. OK. Um, well, why did we do this? Um, I said that this is like really bad from an algebraic viewpoint, or really good, depending on like I don't know your personality. Um, this has a non. This has trivial Alexander polynomial. So it's it's a theorem uh, of Conway and Powell uh, from 2020 that because uh, the Alexander polynomial of Whitehead K is one. Oh, these two surfaces, I mean, they weren't thinking about these two surfaces in particular. I just, this just follows from a theorem. A whitehead sigma 0 and whitehead sigma 1 are topologically isotopic. Real boundary. Um, so they prove that, that disks with the same boundary, um, with, with group Z and trivial Alexander polynomial, are always topologically isotopic. For positive genus, it's more complicated. Um, but for Seifert surfaces, it's easy. So um, these two surfaces are topologically isotopic, but nevertheless, they're not smoothly isotopic. So that means we have an exotic pair, uh, which I guess, I don't know, if you're interested in four-dimensional topology, it's kind of like the goal, right? So that's good. Um, so Seifert surfaces can actually be like very interesting. OK, uh, so in my last two minutes, I'll just tell you an open question. And I guess I'll mention that, in fact, we have lots more examples. We have infinitely many pairs of examples or, or bigger finite families. Um, they can be higher genus. They can be non-orientable. We prove a general statement about strongly quasi-positive surfaces. Um, and in particular, these, these two surfaces, well, the whitehead doubles, aren't isotopic to each other. Um, and we produce explicit states or cycles in the Kavana homology where the maps are different. But they both surfaces induce non-trivial maps. But we also have examples where like one of the surfaces is a trivial map and one's not, which is weird. Um, OK, but here's the question that's open, which I have no idea how to do. Uh, so question, um, or problem, I don't know. Uh, can you find uh, an infinite family Uh, let's just say sigma i for i and z of Seifert surfaces, uh, same genus, genus G Seifert surfaces, which uh, first of all, you could just say like our pairwise, our pairwise uh, not topologically isotopic. Um, 
I told you that the obstruction for us was the intersection form and the two full branch covers. Algebra makes me like really nervous. I just don't know if you can have an infinite family. Uh, that seems like weird to me. Like that seems really hard. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't know if you can make an infinite family that aren't topologically isotopic, but I also don't know if you can make an infinite family that are top isotopic, uh, but not smooth isotopic. Uh, and this is all in B4. Um, the sort of two problems, or I guess like really one fundamental problem here with, with either of these, is that your, your first step will be coming up with this family sigma i, and then proving that they aren't isotopic to each other, right? Um, but I, 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 really, I really mean it when I say that um, almost every construction that I'm aware of, uh, of surfaces in S3 that, that are not isotopic to each other are fundamentally isotopic in B4, like just obviously isotopic in B4. Shouldn't say isotopic, some people proved it. So I mean, shouldn't say obvious, some people proved it. Um, so the exception is that these two surfaces are based on a paper of Lyon, 1974. Um, a little bit different, because his whole thing was making hyperbolic examples, and like th these are twisted whitehead doubles of trefoils, so like super not hyperbolic, so probably wouldn't like this. Um, but it's basically the same thing. Um, but, you know, he uses this symmetry uh, of this torus link to get a pair of examples. Um, and I don't see any way to adapt this to get an infinite number of examples all at the same time. Um, so the, the, the fundamental problem here is just how would you even produce your, like, infinite family, let alone show that they're different. But I, I don't know. I think this is, like, a really interesting problem to think about. Um, so now it's 46, and I can stop. That's right. So in fact, that's, that's how we get some other weird examples. Um, if you take like a, well, these aren't minimum genus, but they also have non-trivial induced map on Kavanaugh homology. But on the other hand, you could take the genus one surface and add a tube, and that has zero map on Kavanaugh homology. So it clearly can't, like it's compressible. It can't be smoothly isotopic to either of these. Uh, that, that's just one more time. Oh. Yeah, we, we do some things. To, uh, we make the minimal genus by, um, I think Robert actually showed a picture. We, we, instead of just actually stop, instead of just whitehead doubling, we can then do like a band sum with a trefoil surface. Yeah. So you, you can make the minimal genus if you want. Um, and we just check minimum genus with snappy or something. Uh-huh. If you keep whitehead doubling, do they stay non-isotopic? Um, I'm. It's a diagrammatic argument. Like, we, uh, uh, let me just think for a second. Like, what what we do is produce an explicit cycle here, and then basically whitehead double the cycle. With the one that we use, we make sense of what that means. Um, my guess is that if you keep whitehead doubling, you can keep repeating the argument for that particular cycle. But I didn't check, and I hope is. Is Isaac there? No. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I would ask Isaac to guess before I tried, probably. <laughs> I think probably. Yeah. Oh, so he asked, do we have genus one examples that are exotic? And uh, no. Um, yeah, yeah, all of our genus one examples have non-trivial Alexander polynomial. And I, I just don't know how to, well, I think, I think, all of the ones that I can think of just aren't topologically isotopic. And I definitely don't know how to deal with this without the Conway-Powell theorem. So that's a good problem, too. Yeah, Tom. Um, oh, uh, why are they cycles? Um, you can just check, like, all of the zero smoothings uh, in this diagram are, uh, it's, it's like they're all, Oh, actually, no, I don't have to say that. I think um, every crossing uh, involves two different circles in this state, and everything is labeled x. So yeah, that's why. What is my favorite knot? It's just, uh, oh, 820, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's fibered, and it's ribbon, and it's a pretzel, and it's better than everything. 
Yeah. Oh, so that the two uh, covers are not diffeomorphic. Oh, that's so he, he asked uh, for for zoom. He asked um, the topological isotopy obstruction went through the double covers are not homeomorphic. So could you have shown that the double covers are not diffeomorphic using Hagar floor? And like, I I've never tried to compute that before, so I don't maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean it seems really reasonable, <laughs> but I'm I would ask Irving. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> he's not here, though. <laughs> oh, he's here. <laughs> oh, like, yeah, I definitely don't know how to do that. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So this is um, uh, so. So yeah, he he said uh, if if you like Kavanov, the Kavanov chain complex is so big, but somehow we've given a way of of just looking at like one specific part of it and using that to distinguish the surfaces. And really, I think this is what maybe all of Isaac's papers are about. It's kind of like Isaac's thing, um, and they're very good at it. And uh, it's also an it's Kyle's thing too. They have a, a paper with this like table and. Um, this is how they distinguished uh, the disks that uh, Robert mentioned in the previous talk uh, by producing an explicit cycle. And, and somehow the cycle, it's natural when you look at the picture. Um, this cycle somehow looks a lot like sigma 1. Um, we sort of have these like regions that look like the overlapping parts. And whenever they actually overlap, we get a circle. And there's some sort of like general rule um, for how to get a, uh, a cycle, at least for like a, a strongly quasi-positive surface, where you know the map will be, be non-zero. Um, and then it, we're just lucky that it doesn't look anything like this surface. So. Um. Uh, no, actually, so I, I knew about these surfaces with, um, I, I was talking to someone, and someone was talking to Jung, and we sort of like knew these surfaces existed. And then I gave a talk at uh, a conference at ISERM, and I said, you know, like, they're probably distinguished by their Kavanov or not floor maps, but I don't think anyone can compute the not floor maps, and I personally don't know how to compute the Kavanov maps. And within like three minutes of the talk ending, Isaac Sundberg emailed me, it was like, what are the surfaces? And like, I sent Isaac the surfaces, and I was like, you know, maybe I'll hear back from them like eventually. And then like two days later, uh, they sent this picture. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then uh, uh, Kyle had this like cool thing about strongly quasi-positive surfaces, and, and then we realized that it all didn't matter, and they weren't even topologically isotopic, and that was like a whole thing. 